Welcome to Afterlives with Kara Cooney, in which we discuss ancient Egyptian history and relevant current events that we think will be of interest to our audience. I am Kara Cooney, and I'm a professor of Egyptology at UCLA. This podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at UCLA. In recent years, I've become active in communicating with the general public about the history of ancient Egypt through lectures, interviews, social media, books, and guest appearances. This podcast is my opportunity to take the kinds of deep dives into history that are not always possible in academic formats. Leaders, power, and trickle-down economics. No. So this was April 16th of 2020. Again, I think you're teaching the Divine Kingship class to the undergrads. Um, talking about how the students have all these really great questions from our live discussions, I think help, you know, um, get stimulate thoughts and get ideas flowing. Um, But again, so this idea of trickle down economics, uh, you know, leaders spinning propaganda in the modern and ancient world. um, And trickle down is everything. But also how, you know, if the economy is going bad, whose fault is it? It's the president's fault. Even though he's one person, he can't you can only do so much and so mm-hmm. affect things so much. But if the economy is going good, it's, oh, the president's great. He's doing great. If it's going bad, it's his fault. And the stocks, you know, show. Um, and then you talk a lot about predestination, this idea yeah. of monuments being used to kind of predestine success and to, you know, spin how people view things to make the leader look good or bad and how, I like um, that. It's very American, yes. this idea is a predestination where mm-hmm. we assume that somebody is good because they're wealthy, they're, they're accepted by God because they're favored mm-hmm. with blessed with children, wife, whatever. Um, so I think, I think Americans understand this idea of predestination in their bones. Yep. And the Egyptians were also very good at spinning this into a material reality yep. with monuments and other things. Let me, so mode it be, <laughs> in a sense, mm-hmm. just making it happen. Yeah. 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 And the idea, I think, to, you know, belief in trickle down, but that it actually, in turn, you know, ends up upholding these inequalities that we see, but that we all think that there's a, a way out of them or we're the next. In some way, there's and... no greater ideology than trickle down. Because... Do you see that playing out in the Egyptians, too, that they had this idea of things trickling down from the top that, oh, if the leader and the elites are wealthy and doing well, then we are better for it too. It's so hard to talk about ancient Egypt because the only, in in those terms, Mm -hmm. because the only people we can really talk about are those who left behind any sort of records, which is the top 5% of society. So for a lower elite, I think trickle down made a big impact Mm -hmm. on them because then they could connect with higher elites. For the peasant in the fields, I, I- Did their life really change? Did their life change whether they were ruled by Akhenaten or Ramses II or in some sort of intermediate period, how much did their life change? um yeah it's that that's a it's a difficult Mm -hmm. question but for us in our world today and for the lower elite of the ancient egyptians trickle down the idea that you could somehow grab the coattails of that powerful person who has been destined by by Mm -hmm. the gods to to take you higher it's um it allows us to be apologists for people taking more money than is their due and um justifying why there is social inequality in the world yep so keep watching if you want to find out more because this is after lives with kara cooney (laughs) on um, egyptian kingship and the ideology of kingship and they're all doing presentations on they they're all picking a king or picking a dynasty if there's not as much information about that king um and it can be an Egyptian king or not. We're, we're being pretty broad, so they can pick somebody who's not Egyptian. And they look at how that leader is portraying himself. It's usually himself, though there are female rulers out there to choose from, as we know. Um, but how that leader is portraying him or herself to their elites, to the public. Um, and they're doing um, digital exhibitions on these leaders. So it's pretty fun. And I realize what I've created as... I'm sitting in the Zoom discussion with, you know, 100 kids about, and they're asking me all these questions like, why did they destroy certain parts of the statue? When they made a statue out of a certain material, did they paint it? And um, why would a king depict himself wearing a Nemi's headdress in one case and, 
and a blue crown in another and why do they not have the beard what does it mean that it's small or big and i'm like oh my god these are this is great because essentially everyone is asking about what it means to display a large monumental image of the leader versus what it means to display a small and intimate salon portrait of the leader that only few would have gotten to see what are the different um, agendas involved with with such depictions and um, what does it mean to display wealth overtly um, we talked about obelisks and um, how we still don't know how they were cut with such precision. Yes, we know, know about dolerite pounders and the remnants are there in the Aswan quarries of the poor guys who had to sit there for day upon day with dolerite pounders that were harder than the granite going like this to remove like, you know, that much stone a day. Um, and that's how you remove a granite obelisk 10 stories high. Uh, but then once you're doing that, how do you get the precise 90 degree angles? How do you get um, the, the thing tapering to a point at the top, how do you get, um, the, the super precise inscriptions of hieroglyphs and imagery? Um, we still don't know how hard stone was cut. And as I told the students in this last discussion, that is exactly what they wanted. They don't want these, um, miracles, the, the trade secrets, the state secrets to be let out of the bag and these things have to be um, kept close to the vest because it helps to maintain a kingly power. So um, it was a fun discussion. I, I enjoyed it. And um, and now I'm, I'm talking to you guys. So um, we also talked about, um, there was one student who asked, um, did the Egyptians really believe that the king had to do rituals every day to make the sun rise and set? And I said, no, no, you know, they would have seen through time and had a cultural memory of a time period when a king was not able to do these rituals. And so there wasn't this primitive, simplistic understanding that if one man didn't do them, the sun wouldn't rise and set. That's too much, right? Instead, it was about this idea that the sun needs to give its prosperity and life-giving rays in a particular way. Um, and that the king was the one who was activated to be able to pull that divinity into the ancient Egyptian space. And I said, I made a comparison, and you guys can tell me if I'm crazy, but like as we see the coronavirus discussions happening, um, there are some people of many different religious persuasions who say that we can meet in our congregation because God will keep us safe in our congregation, we'll be fine, and thus dismiss some of the, the health um, warnings and worries. There are also people who are using this virus ideologically to say that some places have been stricken more harshly with the virus because they are sinning in particular ways. Again, I've seen this from many different um, religious perspectives. And there is an idea that I think is really interesting to follow up on associated with leadership that involves um, a kind of predestination that when bad things happen, a leader can communicate to his people that you, my chosen ones, are predestined to be kept safe and I will keep you safe. Um, if, the, if things are going well, you know, it's because I was predestined, I was chosen as king. It's the same reason that in the United States, if the economy is going well, then the king, or I'm sorry, <laughs> if the economy is going well, the president gets to be reelected. It's not that much different from ancient Egypt. And it means that we human beings, though we look at the ancient world as being so primitive and simple and how could they think this ways, we think these ways. We think that, that the president of the United States is responsible for an economy as opposed to it being systematically created over decades by an organic human um, being that, that create certain things and things move in certain directions and this one person at the tip of the spear really doesn't have a whole lot to do with it. But we make these decisions almost shamanistically. If the economy goes bad, we decide, okay, get the guy out. He's not, he's not doing it right. Um, not that poor decisions can't be made, but, um, but it's an interesting thing that we, we still make these knee jerk reactions about what is good leadership and what is bad leadership by, um, 
how well we think the gods are being pulled into our world and how much we see prosperity being pulled into our world. So um, pretty similar to um, the ancient Egyptians from that perspective. Not that you got to vote leaders in or out of power in ancient Egypt, but um, I think the elites had a lot more power than we can see. And I think that the kings had to please them a lot more than, um, than we give credit for. So um, Trump is a king, no, oh dear. <laughs> hey, from Houston, my parents are in Houston and um, they're doing well. Um, everyone's, everyone's still safe and healthy. Brazil, that's wonderful. And I know people from Egypt are watching. That's good. Um, yeah, so um, getting back to some of these ideas, and um, then I'll, I have to go take my next call, so this will be a short one. Um, the obelisk, which was what one student was asking about, um, and hard stones and what it means. Um, the obelisk is like that a miracle of prosperity. It's like um, a predestination of prosperity. If a king has the ability, strength, the wherewithal, can marshal the power, the skill sets to put up an obelisk 10 stories high, then that king is predestining himself to be economically successful. It is, it is a way of proving a fait accompli. It's already been done. And I want you guys to all go out and look at the world around you and see how leaders have placed uh, monuments in certain places have made communications in certain places as a kind of predestination of success. Um, the the Calvinists didn't invent predestination. <laughs> this guy, this idea of something already being so before it is so, um, and a God given thing before we could see it, is a very old human idea. Um, the the other thing that that we talked about that I think is really interesting and very um, relevant for what we deal with today, economically in terms of leaders, is trickle down. And, you know, they're like, but why would they let, you know, the, the people at the top take all of this stuff and present all of this wealth and, and show all of this power? And I'm like, because people believe in trickle down economies, trickle down religion, trickle down ideology. They, they believe that, if you know you stick close to the popular person that you'll be popular too that if you hang out with the rich people then not just that the rich will rub off on you but the connections to those rich people and their opportunities will certainly find their way to you so these um these ideas of trickle down where it gets more confusing to me and where i'm not quite sure is that if a leader is placing some big image of themselves um and that can happen in a, in a number of ways. It can be a big monumental statue from Egypt or from Stalinist Russia, or it could be a big military flyover um, over an NFL field. It could be something that we don't really get to participate in. We get to consume and we get to witness, but its power and strength trickles down to us. So if Stalin is staring at you from on high or Ramses II from on high, you feel watched, protected. You feel like his strength is your strength. The military is your military. Um, that, that military flyover over an NFL field, that that military strength, that American strength is your strength somehow. Um, this idea of trickle down, I think one reason that rich people use it so often and say, oh, I'm rich and so you'll be rich. I'm rich and I'm going to create jobs. You need to keep me rich. You need to allow me to be rich. You need to let me not pay taxes. <laughs> um, this has been going on for since complex civilization has existed. And people buy into it because they, not just because they believe they can be rich too, but they believe that some of that wealth will trickle down to them. So um, lots of... Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, signature on the check. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I'll leave you guys to point out the overt similarities from the ancient world to today's world in terms of power and ideology. It's all there. Um, I'll, I'll point out some of the more obvious things, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. So we'll leave this one um, short and sweet. Um, I'll call it um, trickle down of power or something like that and um, get this posted and I'll um, try
trying to talk to you guys again tomorrow. Okay? Um, hang in there. Stay healthy. Be kind. You know the drill. Um, and I'm going to go check on my friend who is very sick with the thing. And oh my God. Okay. Everyone hang out and, and, and do well. Thank you to our listeners for your support and for subscribing wherever you listen. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review and help raise our profile and let others know about it. Send your questions related to the show and topic suggestions for future episodes to karakuni at gmail.com. You can find the video version of the show on my YouTube page and full show notes will be posted in the podcast section of my website, karakuni.squarespace.com. For that, thank you, Amber Myers-Wells. There you'll also find info on my books, upcoming lectures, and you can subscribe to my newsletter. You can find me on Facebook at Karakuni Egyptologist and on Twitter and Instagram at Karakuni. See you next time on Afterlives with Karakuni.